For as long as I've known the NBA, it's been a stars league. But even among the stars, there's an exclusive club. Russell and Dr. J. Bird and Magic. Jordan. Kobe. They're all part of a select group that paved the way for the NBA superstar of today. And some even shared secrets with each other along the way. Join me as I trace the evolution of the NBA icon from the early days. And he said, tell me, Pat, who who is Julius Irving? I said, well, Fitz, he's the Babe Ruth of basketball. Through the years of icons. We noticed that everything he did looked like Michael. To the moves, to the walk, to the talk. It was like a home, ongoing joke. All the way to today. From Spotify and the Ringer Podcast Network, I'm Jackie McMullen. And this is the Icons Club. The series premieres on March 18th on the Book of Basketball 2.0 feed. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S, I-A-N dot com at Lassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan and I am an editor at the ringer.com and joining me on the other line, pushing his daylight savings agenda, it's Andy Greenwald! What a week for us. The Sunshine Boys, I like to call us. The big K Street lobbying firm of Andy Greenwald and Associates pushed through daylight savings time being permanent. Man, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been tough. Do you know, people have this image of American farmers as kindly, you know, as salt to the earth or whatever. But you get into a lobbying war with them, they are vicious. They throw mud, but it's not mud. It's like nutrient-rich, loamy soil, and it gets at you. Chris, we have a Jake Johnson interview today, so we can riff because we're good. We have a great show already. We do. In fact, like what we're going to talk about at the top of this pod is just um, some upcoming release dates that we're keeping our eye on, but we don't have enough eyes. And the, the sort of <laughs> maybe hitting this point where... Is it's not is this too much TV? It's not is this too much TV to keep track of? Because it is, but it's also like you know it 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 beats working for a living. But it's really kind of fascinating that this next six weeks is I think as stacked as any like cultural moment that I can remember, regardless of like the medium, regardless of television, movies. Like I don't remember a time Mm -hmm. where we have this many notable titles coming out in a six week period. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. I was going to ask you if you are, are you a were you are you a big like daylight savings time like do you have do you have a strong take on that? Yeah, well first of all, I love the way you're pretending that I'm driving this conversation when you gave me a personalized push alert that this occurred. I was just minding my own driving my car my phone well, buzzed with a message. I was just like of all the things that we're taking care of in this country, we just like knocked this out with unanimous consent. A total surprise drop. I loved it. It's like they were the United States Supreme Senate. You know what I mean? It was just like, it was wild. It's like they can literally change the laws of time, but they can't make voting laws. It was really, I respected it. (laughs) I respected it. I I am very pro this because um, as people who listen to this podcast know, I have children and it's just stupid. 
it's stupid to be like, guess what, guys? Time is bending this weekend. <laughs> and though I know your body says, wake up, wake up. You can't because it's 5 a.m. now. <laughs> Please don't. Yeah. So, well, no, I read I'm, that the I'm issue online. is that like it's not so much for people living like let's say where Marco Rubio is a senator in Florida because of equatorially like it's mm. not that big of a deal down there but like if you live in northern Michigan you know mm -hmm. then that's like you're taking your kids to school in the dark am did, I am I right did, did you read Senator and Sheldon maybe that's Whitehouse's... why Kelly Stafford left Michigan to get to California you know I, I think that's why I think I think that's also she was fleeing a dictatorship which is something that you know I, it connects her to many people around the world did you read the comments by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, the one of the two senators from a, a he was state one of the co-sponsors of the went bill, actually, in, Rhode Island? He was basically like, if you read his quote and then you imagine like a crying Jordan meme, it's really rich because basically he was like, he was like in the winter time in Cranston and Warwick and all the fine towns along the coast, father son dips his head into the ocean at four fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand it like all the coffee and milk in the world isn't bringing back your good mood after that like yeah that is gnarly it is tr it is wild that as a nation as we become more hopefully a little more plugged into mental health issues that we're just like once a year though we are going to pull the rug out from everybody and just make it unrelentingly dark and bleak in the afternoon it's awful what are we doing i i, I do think though that like the lack of you know, as we spring ahead, right? Spring forward. So now it's daytime later. It's like yeah, the sun's up great. later. It it just puts a little bit of a squeeze on our TV time, on our well, TV watching I, time. I, I actually was going to make the same segue because I wonder, and I'm only, I would say I'm 70% joking if Netflix lobbied, will lobby against this. Because all of a sudden it's light here until seven. It'll be light until eight. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, cave going into a, a couch cave anymore you know are I'm you not one of those it. people who still feels like your tv and movie watching should happen in, in the evening in the dark <laughs> i do i still yes. i'm still programmed by big prime time i'm still like eight o'clock is when i start watching tv now for professional purposes i watch like stuff during the day now but like right. if i had my druthers i would watch stuff at night no it's always at night also because i you know i think people parent differently but we are a television is not on if children are around because then you lose them. You just cognitively lose them to whatever <laughs> is, is on. Is that why? Is that why when I came over the other week and I was watching the Bucks game on my yes. phone and your kids were like, they were like why, why is the monolith from 2001 in front of me? Yes. Yes. I mean, I'd like to think that I'm raising like independent, strong, you know, decisive, critical thinkers, but you could Pied Piper the shit out of them. If uh -huh. you just have a basic cable <laughs> subscription, like it, it, a picture in picture is all it would take. It's all it would take. A car commercial and they're gone. They would follow you anywhere. So as Andy mentioned earlier, we do have Jake Johnson from uh, the HBO Max show Minx on today. Jake is uh, one of our favorite recurring guests on The Watch. And today, uh, today was an all timer. I, I, I almost like don't even want to spoil anything by talking about it. Let's just say that if you are familiar with what Minx is about, it's about um, a 1970s. California housewife who wants to start a feminist magazine can't get funding. So she uh, goes into business with a porn publisher to publish an erotic version of her feminist magazine. Uh, and Jake Johnson plays said porn publisher. The, the year of the D is still going strong after euphoria mm. on TV. So there's a lot of male full frontal nudity, which we discussed with Jake in quite, a I lot. think gripping detail, yeah. Shocking, um, shocking levels so of detail. So check out, the, check out Minx because Andy and I both really enjoyed it and uh, Jake's fantastic in it. And, I, I, and now I, I'm going to keep talking about the rest of the podcast. I, I, I could uh, keep talking about how Jake's great. <laughs> I just didn't know if you I just thought you were going to jump that. in about Minx. Um, I really like Minx. Minx, Minx is a, it, it, it's a very, you describe the premise and then the show can get going and then it's like has all the hallmarks of something that can really run for a long time. It's charming, it's fun, it's well cast and it's like basically a workplace comedy that also has this uh, additional layer of, of, of topical interest and also um, a, lot of, a lot of dongs. I don't know how else to so, put it. Minx like functions almost as like a starter's gun for this run that we're about right. to go on here. And I don't know when the run is going to end. Frankly, I only like I, I, I just felt like as I was watching 
TV is like, you know, you have HBO Max on or something and they'll be like coming soon. And I just felt like every single thing was like April. I was like, that's, I, you know, because like we grew, we ca- kind of came of age as podcasters in the era when there was like two things were, two or three things might be on a, on a Sunday and then maybe one thing was on a Wednesday. And those were the four shows we watched for two or three months. Do you remember when we would have to huddle up to be like, well, what are we going to cover from November until January? Like we weren't right. even sure. There were not right. options. And that's when we used to read like, Jeremy Renner house flipper fan fiction and stuff like that. And those were those were honestly we didn't know how good we had it. Those are good. So days. I'm going to walk you through the next couple of weeks, Andy. And you know, I, I I expect you to jump in and say I'm very excited about this. Maybe add some context. And there's a couple of things that just had trailers drop, so we can also talk a little bit about what we've seen so far from these shows. Can I give just just before we start? I really think it's an interesting moment, and I think it's interesting for two reasons. Because I think that you could easily look at this wild content glut of the next month, month and a half, two months and say, well, this is, this is sort of the, 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 the caboose of the COVID disruption train, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot, I don't think any of the streamers or networks intended for there to be this level of bottleneck, uh, at this precise moment in this calendar year. Some of these shows have been delayed years, some of them months, um, some of them were always scheduled to go now. And here we are. But I actually think what we're seeing is much more emblematic of the state of the industry, which right. has, you know, which we've said it before, and now we're really seeing the result of it. Every single one of the shows we're about to go through was made with good intentions by people who gave their all and deserve to be, you know, every one of these shows deserves to be considered on its own merits. But the reason that they all exist at this moment is less about giving each of these creators their moment in the sun or, you know, a, an amplified voice as it is these streamers are desperate to flood their coffers with content to show shareholder growth and to keep their numbers moving up or at least not dipping down. And that's when it starts to feel overwhelming. If you see, if you listen to this list and you're like, there's no way I can watch all of these shows, you are right. There is yeah. not some... Hollywood czar being like, well, let's let's hold this to Q4 because, you know, the good folks at, at whoever are not going to be able to watch it all. No, they don't care. They don't care. The Disney, so, Plus, Disney Plus pipeline has to stay open or else they will start to lose confidence in their ability to retain the current subscription number. So Moon Knight's coming and Ms. Marvel's right behind it. Who cares if you have time? Right. And then Obi-Wan's coming right after mm-hmm. Moon Knight. So it's like the the entire... Look, look will you, let's just run through the show. So next week alone, we have... Uh, Atlanta returning for season three. Halo on Paramount Plus, which is a blockbuster adaptation of the Xbox game. And Starstruck, which is a very well-regarded rom-com on HBO Max coming back for its second season. We we haven't covered Starstruck, but I mentioned it because I know a lot of people who are big fans of it. And it's just worth mentioning, I think, because Atlanta is obviously going to soak up a lot of the critical uh, space for that week that it drops. And uh, Halo will certainly be interesting to see what they've been sitting on for this years and years development of this, which would have been like a huge franchise movie maybe six, seven years ago and is now they're trying to make it into this flagship for Paramount+. Plus. Shows like Starstruck might go a little bit under the radar. It might actually find, you know, maybe it catches some spillover audience for a variety of other things, but I think that's the thing that I'm most interested about having like this conversation maybe at the beginning of May and saying, what mm-hmm. what do we feel like kind of was able to stick its head above the parapet and what maybe went overlooked mm-hmm. because it was in competition for eyeballs? So after that first week, 324, and I don't think we need to really say how much we're looking forward to Atlanta, right? You no, know, and we haven't seen any screeners. I don't think any are available, but it is wild to me how long it's been since that show has been on the air and that it's just going to be back now. It's great. Yeah. And then on March 25th, Netflix puts out the second season of Bridgerton, which is one of the biggest shows Netflix has ever produced. And mm-hmm. Apple releases the first few episodes of Pachinko, which we have uh, an interview with a showrunner from Pachinko, Su Hyu, coming next Thursday. And I've seen the first three episodes of Pachinko. The reviews are out. I agree with the sentiment that has been expressed largely across the board by critics, which is the show's a miracle. The show is absolutely beautiful and quite moving and is an incredible adaptation of this of this book. And... I, I I think it's probably probably the best thing I've seen this year so far. Wow. But you know, this is the period of time when it, like I could see that changing three or four times in the next six weeks. You know, after that 
on the March 29th, Girl from Plainville drops. We've seen a couple of trailers for that. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Friend of the Pod, Liz Hanna, uh, show running with Patrick McManus. Um, that is yet another in this uh, 2022 pattern of ripped from the headline miniseries. Uh, this one starring Elle Fanning. It's a case that many people probably read about or heard about um, in which a woman was tried for texting, essentially texting encouragement to a boyfriend to end his life and whether she was culpable for it. Um, very curious about that in, in how you how you make a series out of that and what the perspective is going to be. But here's the thing. Elle Fanning's really good. I know this mm-hmm. isn't like a hot, hot, hot take, but a um, little bit more of the great season two been been percolating in the Greenwald household. And you know, her, her and Nicholas Holt are just really, really strong doing really high level work. Um, kind of, I mean, this is, this is the conversation we're having. That's a major show that I think has its fans and adherents and it's produced at a very high level and it doesn't really get talked about by us. Um, yeah, it's out there. I mean, I enjoyed what I watched of the second season. I was, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to finish it. Um, on March 30th, the day after Girl from Plainville drops Moon Knight premieres on Disney Plus, and I'm very, very, very excited about it. I'm, I don't want to say I'm like worried, but I will say that I think that like the variance of yeah. how good it could be is how good it could be is really high. And if if it doesn't work, I think it might not work spectacularly, but I'm really hoping it works. It, it is also really going to be worth our close eye, not just because two of our favorite actors are in it, Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke, but this really is, I mean, I, the coverage of it has been interesting. And when Oscar Isaac hosted Saturday Night Live the other week, um, it was a very good episode, he, in his monologue, he was basically like, I'm so excited to be joining the Marvel Universe as Moon Knight. And it's like... like oh, I didn't know the subway ran there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I thought you had to take the air train to get there. But no, you are he is now in the Marvel Universe. And he, as I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing actor and a star. But this is their first attempt to be like, and this is a major new thing that's only going to be here, right? Unless I'm forgetting something major. That, otherwise, they have been essentially spinoffs of the pre-existing uh, MCU. That's right. So that following week, after Moon Knight, well, actually the following day on the 31st of March, How We Roll comes out. Now, I we usually don't talk about CBS sitcoms, but this one comes from Pete Holmes, uh, and we we loved Crashing. And I'm very curious to see what he does with his sensibility on, uh, on a network because Pete Holmes is actually someone who I wonder whether might work fine on a network because he's not a very racy yeah. comedian to begin with. No, he's and a clean comedian. So I was curious whether or not this might actually be this might actually be a perfect place for him. And on that same day, a show called Julia comes out on HBO Max, I guess. And that stars Sarah Lancashire, who's best known for Happy Valley, playing Julia Child. These are two shows that, like I said before, um, like could fall under the radar because of the sheer amount of stuff coming out, but really deserve our attention. Also, if if How We Roll is good, and by the way, some people have said Grand Crew is good. I haven't watched that mm-hmm. yet. I should check it out. Uh, Carl Tart is in that, a comedian I really like, comedic actor. Um, th- then you start thinking about trend piece, Chris. Three or yeah. four, because Ghost- Abbott Elementary, yeah. Ghost is funny, big hit. Abbott Elementary, we love that show. Legitimately love that show. Renewed for a second season, you know, no brainer. Is, is network comedy back because no one was paying attention? I mean, obviously, America was paying attention, but I mean that like all the- the hot young minds are going trying to pitch their, you know, interconnected serialized dramedy. And then people right. are just like, maybe we just want to laugh again. Maybe America's ready to laugh again. You tell me. Well, the following week after these two two interesting under the radar shows come out, Netflix is putting out a movie by Richard Linklater and a movie by, by Judd Apatow. And Apple is putting out one of my favorite things I've seen so far this year, along with Pachinko, which is Slow Horses, which is, we've talked about before, the adaptation of the Mick Heron novel, uh, Jack Loudon and Gary Oldman and Kristen Scott Thomas star, and it's it's really great. Uh, I'll just say that, and I can't wait for people to see it. So that's all coming out the following week. Then the Oscars happen. Mm-hmm. Then Tokyo Vice comes out, which a lot of people have uh, asked me like what I... People on like social have been like, "What do you what do you think?" And I think it looks pretty sick. I mean, I I'm kind of curious to see whether it's just Michael Mann does the pilot, and then is the producing director mm-hmm. or the you know like is just a producer going forward. Um, y- you know that 
I think a lot of it will probably de- be determined by what, what whether Elgort's any good in this show. You know, I, I, I think it looks really cool. Though. What, did you, what did you think of the trailer? Chris, have you ever prepared like a beautiful piece of fish at home? You know, and you, you I think you, you know that right. what the answer is to that question. The temperature is great. Maybe you've made a, a pan sauce, or perhaps you've 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 broiled it in a in a, in a marinade that becomes the sauce, and you, you get it onto the plate, and you you know we live in California where there's an abundance of citrus, and you slice into a perhaps even a Meyer lemon. Let's get crazy, and yeah. you squeeze it over the top, and you cut into it. It's perfectly done. You put it in your mouth, but with all of your loving attention, you didn't notice that a lemon seed had fallen on top of the fish and is in your mouth and you bite down and there's just an explosion of bitterness that ruins everything. That was my experience watching Ansel Elgort in the trailer for Tokyo Vice. Okay. And my my question is, are there going to be a lot of lemon seeds in this? (laughs) Or will I be like, oh, it's an interesting bitter note and it works for the dish. I, I am just generally have not been a big fan ever since he came at you on Twitter. And because of that, um, because I am loyal, you know, and I roll for my my number one guy. I can't kind of get over that. But but in all seriousness, I'm watching this trailer. And I'm like, I have dreamed my whole life without realizing it for a Michael Mann directed crime <laughs> show set in Tokyo. Like that is yeah. what I also want. But I'm getting weird lemon seed vibes. That's all. I'm excited. By the way, okay. Ken Watanabe, love that guy. Great actor. Um. So after Tokyo Vice, we get 61st Street, which uh is another one of these shows that I I fear may go overlooked. It stars Courtney B. Vance and it comes from Peter Moffat who did Sherlock, uh, the the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock. And this Mm -hmm. is a crime drama set in Chicago on AMC. I'm just really curious to see, see this. And like Courtney B. Vance is one of those sort of never not great TV actors. It's really true. So yeah, I'd really love to check out him leading a drama. Anatomy of a Scandal comes out on April 15th on Netflix. It's a David E. Kelly crime drama with Sienna Miller and Rupert Friend. On that same day is Outer Range, which we talked about a little bit earlier in the week. Uh, The Josh Brolin Western mystery that I'm really jacked for. And Roar, which is the anthology show from the Glow creators with Nicole Kidman. I mean, that's on Apple TV. That's one week. Is this the (laughs) point when we just say, let's pivot back to books? No, because here's what happens the following week. On April 17th, First Lady with Viola Davis, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Jillian Anderson. On April 18th, Better Call Saul returns. And on April 20th, the second season of Russian Doll drops. Okay, because what I'm saying is I'm reading a really interesting Polish novel right now called Drive Your Plow (laughs) Over the Bones of the Dead. And I think that maybe the the, the, the most the watch thing we could do in April is just zag. You know what I mean? Like, she's a... Don't you want to talk about Saul, though? Don't you want to talk about Russian Doll? I do, but I'm starting to sweat just having this conversation with you. This is where April gets really, really nuts. This now April it 15th gets nuts? To, the last two weeks of April, so we said Russian Doll on the 20th. On the 24th is Barry, Gaslit, and The Man Who Fell to Earth, the Showtime show with Chiwetel Ejiofor, based on the Walter Tevis novel. I mean, and then you get to April 25th. It's We Own the City, the David Simon series uh, starring John Bernthal and, and Jamie Hector. Uh, April 28th, The Offer of, of, and Under the Banner of Heaven. So The Offer is the Godfather show on Paramount+. Plus, and Under the Banner of Heaven, we talked about a couple weeks ago. It's the adaptation of the John Krakauer book with Andrew Garfield. And then April 29th is Shining Girls, which is on Apple and is the new Elizabeth Moss mystery. Okay, so a couple things. First of all, if you know a TV critic or you have one in your life, yeah, send electrolytes, send snacks, send thoughts and prayers. Two, I'm glad we went through this because we have to level with our audience. We're not watching all these shows, buddy. There's just no way. There's no way. And so I genuinely wonder if this is a time, uh, it's a time of, 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 creativity. It's springtime, a time of rebirth. How could one even approach this? Do we consider April like a all-you-can-eat buffet at Sizzler and just take a little bit of everything Mm -hmm. and watch the first episode of as many things as we can and just kind of touch as many of them as possible? Or do we just carve out some thick slices of Saul and Atlanta and, you know, our, our, our bedrock proteins and they call it a month. It, I, I, it's so I think very it, daunting. It, 
It's actually like, how do you want to talk about TV is an interesting mm. question because Saul, I think you can do on a week to week basis. Yeah, yeah, Not no only question. because there's so much depth at the episodes, but also because of the, the mystery elements of it. I think it lends itself to week to week dissection. I think that Atlanta obviously is an event and should be covered as such. I think Barry in a lot of ways demands that kind of attention. Then you get into like, can you watch all of Russian Doll season two in two days? You know, I mean, like the episodes are relatively short, but Russian Doll is something that I think you have to view in its totality because it's so complex. The plotting and stuff and the vibe of, of, the, of the second season promises to be very intoxicating, but like hard to talk about those Netflix shows all in one gasp. You know, I mean, I basically what like we own the city. It's like this is a major moment. This is a David Simon returning to crime in Baltimore moment. Like that's and it looks that's great. huge. I mean, the trailer and it looks, looks fucking awesome. Looks great. Um, you know, I, all, all I can do is say I, I can foresee a world, for example, where Pachinko. I'm so glad you're having Sue on the podcast. I can't wait to watch the show. Where we watch, I watch the first episode. Maybe we we discuss it. You know, to get people. Hopefully people join us on the journey and then say, we'll circle back after however many episodes. And then I just hope that we're able to, and I hope that we do, you know, um, there's just simply so many shows. I'm glad you mentioned Russian Doll because honestly, you know, I loved the first season. It was on my top 10 for the year. Uh, it was absolutely delightful, surprising, dazzling. And I kind of wonder in this context of it being given to us here, mm -hmm. I'm having a feeling that I never thought I would have, which is, do I need a second season of it? Now, I know that that was something people said at the beginning, you know, when the first season debuted, and it's unfair to say that. We don't even know what it's doing. I trust the creating creative team to do something that is surprising and worthwhile. So I, I, this, I don't even mean this as a troll. I just mean that the world in which Netflix greenlit a second season of a critically adored and commercially uh, observed, let's say, mm -hmm. series... That world is gone. Like, I, I really think that not only has the leadership at Netflix changed, but maybe people's appetites and their approach to all of this has changed. I don't think that second season happens if the first season debuted in 2020 or 2021. I just don't think they're in that business anymore. And this might be, the glut of this month might be one of the reasons why, frankly. Can you tell me out of this list of stuff that I've just rattled through, what's the new show that you're most excited about? Well, because of you, it's Slow Horses. Okay. Um, that just seems like the thing that I'm, I'm most, most, most excited about. But I, I think you're asking the exact right question, which is even just now when we both casually tried to imagine what the month is going to be like, we gravitated instantly to the shows with which we already have a good relationship, frankly, mm -hmm. like the ones that we, we, we can count on and we're eager for. And I think that more than anything else is another of, from this, from today's talk is a sign of where the industry is kind of going and how, you know, it's moved away from the bedrock season to season experience of the TV that I think is becoming ever more valuable. The other thing that I think I noticed that, uh, going through this list, and like you said, it could be the trail end of COVID production stuff, but I noticed that there used to be a sense that you would clear out for certain shows that the yeah. rest of the, the rest yes. of the networks, the rest of the cable channels would be like, ah, Thrones is going here. We're going to kind of move around Thrones. Like if, if there's something that we feel like we want to put up on a Sunday or even just in general, like we want it to have the, the attention share that we want mm -hmm. it to have. And that is obviously not happening. Mm -hmm. That is not even happening for some of the same networks. Now, maybe Apple looks at it and they're not like, yeah, Pachinko and Slow Horses and Shining Girls are competing for the same eyeballs or are driving the same conversation and maybe we're just we're just we fully have emerged into this time where this idea that there can only be three to six tv shows at any given moment that people are watching and talking about maybe that's just like so far over and we're just waking up to it well i i think that you know to go back you don't even need to go that back that far but just in terms of our own experience chris when we were coming up you know 20 years ago as music writers there was an album release cycle that had mm -hmm. noticeable and understandable contours. It, and they were all basically the same in like if you worked for a long lead publication, meaning you were writing and you were preparing an issue three months before anyone would read it, you would be given access to the artist or to the music. And then at this point, the single would drop. And at this point, the album would come out and then the subsequent coverage and the next tier of papers would get the coverage of the access then. And it was all understood. And frankly, like many things from that time, you just didn't question it. And everyone's job, people had jobs based on those cycles. 
And, you know, I hear the glut of things now and please don't, don't, nobody cry for us or worry about us. But, you know, I think the people at Apple who listen to our show hope we like their shows and like it when we talk about their shows, you know, and hope that our listenership who built a relationship with us might check out Severance, for example, because we're enjoying it. But we don't matter. This stuff doesn't matter. They oh, yeah. cycle I have, and the review. Yeah. And, the, and, and we're not saying this to be modest. We just mean literally like the game that these giant titans are, the war that they are waging doesn't care about our eyeball time or when, or, or honestly, when we watch a lot of this. You yeah, know? but I think, I, I, you know, the two things that, the, there are two shows that I think about when you say that. One is Succession, which I think very much was a product, not of us, like yes. liking the show at all, but just in general, like a critical kind of, infatuation with that show that led to I would say a, a healthy success right and then I think that success is put in relative perspective by the jaw-dropping success of euphoria which yes. is successful I wouldn't say despite occasional lukewarm reviews or or dis, a dismissive kind of thing from the from the critical base I don't think critics can really make or break shows I mean they, I guess they could but like I, I'm fascinated by that idea that euphoria is a phenomenon almost outside of the traditional kind of like motors yeah. that drive and, TV success. And I, I think that I'm glad you said that because I think there's a second half to the none of this matters anymore um, nihilism of my previous monologue, which is to say that for as much as every one of these services um, will publicly say and then financially chase the biggest, sexiest project. Like, you know, like Gaslit, for example, is indicative of so much of television of the last few years. And uh, in that, it is based on his, it's based on a podcast, which is based on history, and it is absolutely oozing star power. I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. it, it goes, it's more than, than just Julie Roberts and, and Sean Penn. I mean, it has a lot of really good actors in it. Dan Stevens, Betty Gilpin, uh, Shea Wiggum. Um, and all of these services are interested and intrigued and want the glamour and the glitz of projects like that. I mean, that is, we're seeing so many things ripped from headlines or ripped from podcasts like that. Or s- shows that come preloaded with stars purchased that like that or taken to market like that. Yeah. But what does Succession and Euphoria have in common other than being on HBO? It's that they're kind of old-fashioned. Yeah. Not the content, but in the sense that they were developed, they aired week to week, they didn't necessarily become phenomenons in their first season. And they both, without question, have made stars, have made stars rather than Absolutely. being made and defined by stars. And, you know, it, maybe maybe the real lesson here isn't to say, oh my God, we're dying, everything's changed. It's to say like, Abbott Elementary, Euphoria, mm-hmm. those are big hit shows from the last few months and they're going to be big hit shows when they come back in a year and they don't fit with the trends that we are navigating at the moment. Well, I think this is a healthy exercise, if only just to like kind of get a real sense of of what we have in front of us. Uh, we're going to get into our interview with Jake Johnson. Uh, Andy and I will be back on Monday. I'm sure we'll chat a bit about Top Chef then and a couple of other and, things. And we should just flag, like I don't think we have time to talk about it today because we just want people to revel in our, our conversation about full frontal male nudity and, and Jake Johnson. I wish it was one topic but so yeah. far that's not the case <laughs> but i haven't seen all the episodes of season one but we should flag this hollywood reporter story about the behind the scenes shenanigans of obi-wan uh we can circle back to it but people should check it out um, sure it's it's real interesting it's real yeah. interesting and i i think that i'd rather talk about it with you remember my new podcast skills where i just stake out a really 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 extreme position i really yes. i want to try it out on this show Okay, coming soon on Monday on The Watch. Uh, We were produced by Kai McMullen, as always, and we will be back on Monday. Thanks for listening. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. 
you might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong. But these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Love the way you look this wedding season at Men's Warehouse. With the range of sizes from extra small to big and tall. Explore top styles at prices for any budget, including designer suit and tux rentals starting at just $159. With over 600 locations, in-store consultations, and easy online booking, there's a reason why couples choose Men's Warehouse to find their perfect fit. Men's Warehouse. Love the way you look. Andy and I are really honored to be joined by a pretty important person to this podcast, really to Hollywood too. Um, he'll be honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at this year's Academy Awards. We're really excited for him. I'm way too young for that. Continue. <laughs> Jake Johnson is here. He's in a new HBO show called Minx that Andy and I both find absolutely charming, Jake. And we love to talk to you about this show and everything else. We can start, if you want to do Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, if you want to do Justin Fields, like really what the floor is yours. Well, here's how I'd like to start. And again, mm -hmm. we are all adults. We're all doing our thing. Do you mind redoing that intro and saying new to Hollywood? <laughs> this fresh off the bus kid. Right. The next big thing to set me up for what I am. And that's a kid just starting this crazy game with big dreams. I'm sorry personally that you lost out on the part of Nate and Euphoria. Uh, I know that you were up for that well, and that, that you were really gunning for it. Yeah, thank you. Well, that whole group, that's my peer group. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when when I go out with like my peers and we go to the clubs, you know, I just, I'm so excited that like some of my friends are finally 21 years old and they can, because <laughs> now we have fake IDs I, under 21. I, I got to say, Jake, that when you got, and let's be, let's not beat around the bush, you got dragged by the mainstream press for your behavior in the TikTok house in Hollywood during the pandemic. Yeah. But I was like, Jake is a young, yeah. I believe the term used is boy. Yes, thank you. He's, he's, he's in a house with his friends for the first time. Look, okay, can, can I explain something about you? Just, you? you love pranks. What's wrong with that? Let me just explain something to you old geezers about my generation. Please. We're, we're just having fun. Yeah. I'm out there with Jake Paul challenging professional boxers too, mm -hmm. because, and you know what I'm also really into is NFTs. Oh my God. Because I understand that. <laughs> yes. Because, so that's a great place to start because as our youth correspondent, Jake, is crypto money? So it's all about the blockchain. Andy, you don't understand Web3? No. A hundred percent I don't. Um, but I'm glad we have an influencer on to finally- on this podcast, which I do feel like the third member of, can I for now on be the uh, what the crypto it? guy? No, the youth correspondent. Oh, that would be even better. <laughs> I, I, I think that would be great. Like I, I and, and to be fully honest with you and transparent with our listeners, as you were talking, I was racking my brain to think of a question about a young thing, and I couldn't think of any young things. Like I don't even know the framework to begin this segment. This now, Kaya, I believe I'm correct in saying permanent weekly segment of the podcast. That's we right. got nothing for it for the first one. I guess we'll just have to talk about your TV show or whatever. Uh, that You mean that old geezer show? I, I I act like an old man in it who's heavy set. The prosthetics alone must well, have taken hours. I, job, you know, I did a De Niro. I gained like 15 pounds because yeah. I walk around at probably like 125 pounds. But sure. in that show, I look like a heavy set dude who's about 5'10 and has okay. a hard time standing up out of a sunken... <laughs> Oh, Jesus. 
Okay, and there were a lot of sunken couches in the era. Okay, so let's start because I feel like there's a way to like explain the show, but also get a sense of you as a performer and your commitment. Yeah. So for people who aren't aware, this is an HBO Max original show. As Chris said, it's called Minx. It's set yep. in 1971, and it follows a character named Joyce because all aspiring women in 1971 were named Joyce. <laughs> that is a historical record. <laughs> Ophelia Lovibond plays the part. She's great. She is a feminist who wants to start her own magazine. Um, but In people, the vein of Ms. Magazine, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yet... Uh, perhaps she doesn't quite have the the, the common touch to uh, appeal to the you know the the, the regular reader well, of magazines. She, she goes to a pitch fest to pitch, and at that time, and po- possibly still now, but nobody was interested in a angry feminist magazine that didn't make women seem bubbly and sweet. And she comes across my character, Doug Renetti, who's a smut publisher. Uh, such titles as Milky Moms, you know, Jugs, things like that. And I get her magazine, her literature, and I give it to some of my centerfolds during a photo shoot. And the women find the writing very interesting. And the women who I work with at Bottom Dollar Productions start talking about it a lot. And my character has an idea. And that is, I'm only tapping into creepy guys and I'm making a lot of money. What if I tap into creepy women? Yeah. What if I throw a nice big hog in the middle of this magazine with all this great writing, is there a lot of money to be had? And my character is a true capitalist and doesn't care who's buying or why they're buying as long as they're buying. And so she agrees to come with me, but it's a debate between who's in control and, you know, art versus commerce. And I got to say, all bits aside, I love it. I think it's a great show. The script was one of the best pilots I've read. I think Alan Rappaport's really talented, our showrunner. I think Ophelia is a killer as Joyce because if she's the wrong actor in that right. and uh, she's like annoying or trying to be funny, the whole thing breaks. But she's so earnest that I believe she's a real person. And as part of the, I mean, it, it, to your point about the pilot, it is, it is great and that it's a heavy premise pilot. A lot of moving pieces have to come together to get these people in the same room, let alone in the same room full of dozens of nude male models yeah. to then launch the series, which it does so well. And then, you know, there's all the stuff you want in a half hour show. There's great chemistry, there's comedy, yeah. but it actually has the larger sort of societal stuff at play. The question I have for you as a performer, which I know yeah. is where you begin everything, um, you. you know, it, from your <laughs> toolbox. Thank you. When you went to, when you met with Ellen Rappaport, uh, yeah. she had the pilot script and about being a part of it. And I imagine you arrived at the audition being like, I thank you. I think I was born to play the part of Shane, the nude firefighter. That's right. And so <laughs> yes. what was the conversation like where she was like, you, question. Jake Johnson from the TikTok house, I actually see more in you. And I want you to put on prosthetics, pretend to be older and play this part of Doug which is a much yeah. larger part, if not necessarily larger in the department that matters for the publication of Mix Magazine. So I'm going to break down the truth to you guys that I was asked by HBO Max not to talk about, okay? This is also, this is great because wow. we, if we break this out as a YouTube video, every good YouTube video is like Jake Johnson breaks down the truth. You know, like that's always like it hits the algorithm and it just gets, gets going. So I'm going to give you two things. HBO Max begged me not to say this. And this is the truth of how I got cast. And this is the truth of Minx. The part of Shane was played by Taylor. He did an excellent job, no doubt. His genitalia was played by me. So that is, in fact, my penis. So is it huge? That's not what it's about. I'm an actor. Yeah. So, yeah, the reason they don't want it out there is... There's all sorts of Emmy buzz. There's Oscar buzz for my performance in this. The town's freaking out. You know, I'm getting emails from Brad Pitt, George Clooney, all the top guys. Holy cow, we were at the Tastemaker event. (laughs) and You really (laughs) crushed it. And what HBO doesn't want is, and you have a ginormous penis. And my thought is, one thing at a time, guys, let me absorb these roses because of my performance. When that's done and I've won the Academy Awards, I've won the Oscars, I've done the People's Choice, I've done the Blockbuster Awards. Then Weirdly, you won a Tony for this part, I believe. I know. Well, uh, you know, that was an, an amazing <laughs> opportunity. First of all, I, I need to thank ID, which is my PR. I need to thank UTA, Jacob Fenton, Jay Gassner. I need to thank Dialis, Annie, Christine for hair and makeup. And most of all, I need to thank the fans. 
Uh, also, my wife and kids. Ooh, I ran out of time. <laughs> Woof, we're going to cut that bit. Ooh, I ran out of time. Can you put them first? <laughs> you, you know, I, I don't know if everyone, I, I imagine some people listening know this, Jake, but like the original title for uh, the show where many people first encountered your, your, your talent, if not your girth, was uh, New Girl. And New Girl originally was called Chicks with Dicks. Yeah. <laughs> Liz Merriweather's right. script. So d- is this, is this, I guess I want to ask, is this career full circle for you? Right. This like, is, are you fi- you, you've been, this has been a long time coming. Here's the truth. And guys, we can't just, you know, we were doing some bits earlier. The truth is, and I'm, a, I'm not 21 years old. And, you know, the truth of the matter is I'm a 43-year-old man and I don't know much about that culture and I don't do TikTok, okay? But here's the other truth. My career started off as a faceless man of pornography. <laughs> they felt as if my nose was way too big and I did not have the curvature of the upper frame. Some would mm. say maybe I have a heavy set top, otherwise known as I was insulted and called muffin top at times. Uh, I've been called titties. Uh, <laughs> but my bottom half without denim or underpants was a main player in the porno scene from 1997 to 2011 when New Girl started. So the new wave, really. Kind of like the, yeah, the, yeah that's what we refer to it as. Yeah, the new wave. I was, in every great porno you've seen, my bottom half is Venice. I've worked with every, I know everybody. <laughs> I know everyone in the biz. It is not sexy to do it. It's not romantic. We are business people. We simply go to work shoot 15 orgasms, and clock out. <laughs> the simple as that. I know for you guys, it seems like, that's my dream job. <laughs> <laughs> that's you read my mind. <laughs> that's, what's weird is, people aren't watching this on video, but Chris's face was just, it was he was in cloud nine. He I was, was just, just like, like, I was taking notes. He's like, I'm so jealous. But for me, it was, as I was there, having 15 to 16 orgasms, watching other people experience hundreds of orgasms while I was laying there on my body, saying, you're the greatest lover, you're incredible, you're number one. All I was thinking is, is at some point, I hope my face is on TV. And now because of Minx, March 17th on HBO Max, this is my first time having a speaking part. <laughs> I actually, I do have a quasi serious question about this character, yes. if I'm allowed to ask it. Yes, which is that if I say 70s porn producer yeah. or 70s porn publisher to most people, uh, yeah. they probably would imagine that this guy is a scumbag, right? Totally. Like just on, on, the, on, on the face. But you honestly have an inherent tenderness and likability as a performer anyway. And then I think you imbue this guy with a lot of sweetness. Is that on the page? And, and would you say that this is historically accurate? For, yeah, for- so, here's, so here's really what that is in terms of being honest. So there was a part in the pilot where it said, so when I first started reading, I just thought it was really funny. When I saw like a dick montage, I am immature enough where penises are funny. Right. I, I remember being at Wrigley Field as a kid where they had the trough and you see all the whoppers and biting my tongue not to die laughing. And so I, like, I'm like, that I, is... I'm I'm sorry. I think you're gonna have to explain the trough where you saw all the whoppers. <laughs> like I know that that's maybe that's kid slang. You know what I mean? Like that's. <laughs> oh, sorry. This is, that was TikTok talk. Sorry. <laughs> so at Wrigley Field, when I was growing up a long time ago, I actually am 43, uh, and I'm sure it's changed. But the way bathrooms at uh, stadiums, oh yeah, used, oh, yeah. Was, there was just a huge like a pig trough, like where you would throw feed for animals. And all the, everybody would stand shoulder to shoulder, take their penises off and piss. And everybody was drunk looking forward. Everybody's cracking jokes. And as a kid, when you're shorter, and I was yeah. a kid in the class where I always had to do the class sign. Uh, I was, uh, puberty came late, as they say, 25. <laughs> so, you want to hear a funny story about late puberty? That's a true story. Yes. Uh, so. I had I did not have a pube on my body at 16. I was four foot eleven, about 75 pounds, and we were doing swimming. And my my high school had a swimming pool. We had swimming, and I was next to a kid named Matt Walker who was an adult man. Yeah, there's always like there's always a Matt Walker who can throw like a 75 mile per hour slider and has a mustache. Not only had chest hair, but had like those like back stragglers. So like he had had chest for so long that his back got bored and wanted to join the party. And we're talking six, like the kind of beard that he shaved so much that like 
his skin had changed. And we were sitting next to each other and it was a hairy adult man. And honestly, but looked like a nine-year-old boy. Um, but mentally, we were on the same page. We were friends. Yeah. So we're doing bits, joking, you know, talking about like the cutest girl. And I'm like, dude, she wants me. <laughs> he goes, whoa, Jake, you don't have any hair under your armpit. And I go, what's that? And he goes, lift up your arm. And at that point, the examination, otherwise known as my nightmare, started. And that is, he peeled my arms up like this. The other gentleman came around to realize there was no growth under my arm. There was no even what other gentleman. Did, did, I feel like one this of is the guys a traumatic like a story. Did one of the guys have a jeweler's loop, like uncut gems? He's just like, well, you're right. The jeweler came out of the deep end. Uh, they re- they checked out my legs. There was no hair. And then Matt Walker, who had probably gone through puberty at seven, was so confused by this that he went like, and I remember his face, his facial expression was not one of bullying. It was one of confusion. And he said, why don't you have any hair on your body? And in that moment, I said, the men in my family don't have any body hair. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> It worked. He went, they don't? I was like, no, my dad doesn't have any emails. Like nobody does. And he's like, weird. I was like, yeah, whatever. Anyway, and the moment passed. I realized I would rather have a genetic disorder (laughs) that was a family passed on from family genes than simply say, Puberty hasn't started, Matt Walker. What? what, So I don't want to get too carried away because I want to get back to the trough pissing, but (laughs) what? What did Matt do Focus. when you finally grew hair? Um, it was honestly about a year later, and that moment was only significant to me. So nothing. <laughs> you know, I went to a high school, 3,000 kids. The fact that I did get hair later meant nothing to anybody, except I was like, <laughs> like it's you know, if you have a chia pit and you water it and you water it and then it works and you're finally like, this thing isn't broken. <laughs> <laughs> I always have facial hair. I thought I was one of those human beings that would not ever achieve hair. All right. So we, now we go back up a level in the Russian nesting doll of this story, which yeah. is Wrigley Field uh, yeah. bathrooms. So well, you, found- yeah. <laughs> you, you would go, and, you know, obviously at that time, at that age, the prepubescent guy we've talked about, I would have to grab tweezers to get my tiny penis out of my pants to pee. And out of the corners of my eyes, you would just see adult male penises. And there, it was to this day, the funniest thing of all time, you and a buddy would be in line and you would be standing next to each other. And then there would be some guy being like, I think we're going to take the pirates. And we'd all be like, absolutely, man. And then you would just see, you know, the nose of an elephant next to you. And you'd be like, don't laugh, don't laugh. So that's when I read the pilot and I saw a penis montage. And I saw that the way it was going to go and they said real penises and they said they wanted a real mix of men. So they didn't want just like certain hunks. I thought, oh my God, there's going to be like 70 year olds. And so like, have you guys in skin? And I'm like, I'm taking this job partly. I want to see how that is executed. How it's, it comes and, off, yeah. And, and you wonder, because they pulled it out and they you pulled it off. And yeah, the really. scene, it's funny. You, one, one of the changes for the better, I think, in Hollywood production over the last few years has been the rise of the role of the intimacy coordinator, someone Great. who's on sets, you know, to make sure that people are comfortable with intimate scenes, romantic scenes, nude scenes. And yeah. when we talk about that, you know, the knee jerk response is, well, this is an overdue thing because of the amount of nudity women have been asked to do on yeah. screen. Then you have a, a montage. And it's you um, and Ophelia, the star of the show. The, a lot of the cast is there watching. I will note that during that, and this now tracks for me, because during the montage, when the camera is not fixated on um, dongs, it cuts to you, and your character is delighted. You (laughs) are gleeful. There is a look on your face that now I know is not acting. (laughs) You are having the time of your life. So I, I guess I'm just wondering about the overall vibe, and clearly you enjoyed it. Yeah, so the actual dick montage, we had to do that before uh, the dicks came in, right? So we were not allowed to be on set and reacting in real time because of the intimacy coordinator. Oh, uh-huh. interesting. Okay. 
Um, so, so you had we, to imagine. So we had to do it beforehand. But I'll tell you, it's funny you say that because when I read the script and going back to this type of character, Chris, and the real question you asked, thank you. And I'm sorry for Andy taking this into, <laughs> oh, what are we on stage here? We're trying to do a podcast, Chris. Sorry about it's a, It's embarrassing and I apologize. When I read the script, there was two things that happened. One, I thought, uh, I think it's really funny to be able to discuss men's bodies in a way that's critical but not sexual. And I thought of Burt Reynolds in Boogie Nights, and I think his performance in that was one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. When he, as a straight man, can look at Mark Wahlberg's dick in it and say, like, well, that's a great cock. And I thought, like, man, I want to play a character who looks at men, not in terms of sex, but in terms of profit. Like, and aesthetics, yeah, right. Like, there's an episode that comes up later in the season. Uh, this The show, I think, is great, and I think as it goes, it, get, it truly gets better and better. There's, And I don't want to give anything away, but there's a photo shoot and a model, and his dick is a big part of it. And I got to do an entire scene with a man, and, like, discussing his penis. And there was nothing about it where... Doug is not attracted to it. He's a businessman. And I thought it's really funny and it feels very new to me to be able to do bits where you're talking about men's bodies as product. And I thought, man, if I can tap into the way Burt Reynolds did it, where you never thought Burt is seeing anything besides dollar signs and the greater the dick, the greater the win. <laughs> and I was really want like, I'm used to like it happening with like women where like she's a real beauty and everyone's excited. And I'm used to seeing like a guy's face was really hot, but I thought like, that'd be so funny to like have an actual business discussion about like a guy's butt cheeks. Um, I don't know if this is... Oh, go ahead. Okay, If you want to jump on the butt cheeks, I'll let you do it. I was going to steer things in a more sober direction. I was too. And I was going to say, Jake, great answer to that question. Uh, And now I'm going to tell you my story about my first encounter at a urinal trough, which is I was uh, on a study abroad in Ireland And I had never really been in that kind of like bathroom environment. I guess I had like a much more conservative upbringing in Philadelphia than I thought I did, but it was usually dividers, you know? And so we get to Ireland. I think I was like 19, 18 years old and uh, we did a homestay. So like as soon as we got there, we stayed in this like small Irish village outside of Cork and I was staying with this family and they were like, well, let's go to the pub. And I went to this pub and it's nighttime. Every, it's like a Friday night. And I walk into the bathroom and I kid you not, it's like walking onto the set of a Ridley Scott movie because so much steam is coming off the ice in the troughs while these guys are urinating while drinking Guinness so that it's just this pure biological experiment of like, but it's just like, like, too much, too much. That's too much. Well, look, I get it. I've been in those moments. It's like, it's too much to sit there straight face and then just go like, well, what are we doing later? Are we getting a euros before we get home? <laughs> There's simply 15 guys pissing at the same time on ice and there's steam. And we're talking about like, do we have yeah. another few minutes or an hour before we leave? We're talking it's, about Gaelic football or something. Yeah. yeah. We're in another galaxy here, gentlemen. <laughs> Andy, you were saying. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I can't, I can't, I can't top that story, nor can I legitimately follow it up. So I'll just pivot. Um, I don't know if this is accurate, but I did see that initially perhaps you were a guest star on the series and then became uh, a part of the ensemble. And I guess, you know, here's the thing about you, Jake. We've known you a long time now. We've had you in the podcast. 100% a straight shooter. Everything you say on the record, it's just true. It's always true. And because of that, we can tell that this show really does mean a lot to you. And I could tell even before we got on this podcast because you've been posting on social about it. Like you're pretty, you're pretty excited about this. Full, I'm doing the full press tour. I hired personal PR, which I haven't done in years. Let's do this goddamn thing. And, and I guess I, I'm wondering as a, I'm sorry to break people's illusions as a veteran of at least the industry, at least your bottom half. Kaya, can we cut this and start over? <laughs> what, what, what has been special about this experience? What, because, and, and, and I also say this sincerely, like when we have talked over the years, I know that being, you know, being close to your family, not being away for a long time. Like work-life balance does matter to you. So why is this the special one? So this one came to be, and that guest star thing was contractual because Stumptown still might've happened and we weren't sure. So this one does shoot very close to me. Uh, and this one is, I am near the family. Uh, I do have two daughters. I am very interested in feminist stories. I'm very interested in the stories of um, 
women pushing their world in the workforce, because I've realized a lot of great stories about like, like, yes, this is a feminist tale, but it's also a workplace comedy. To me. And I like that it has these great themes in it. But when I read it and I'm reading Joyce, I love the Joyce type character. I love the really like militant feminist who sees the world in a certain way and no one is going to stop her. I loved the imagery that it was even written about, about the cover of the Majorarchy Awakened. I love <laughs> that old guys are like, why are you so, why is she so angry? You know, there's that great mix. And then when I read Doug, uh, you, you know, professionally, I, I'm not a man who likes to audition. Uh, I, I'm a man who, you know, I like an offer. Uh, in terms of, I, I grew up in junk shops. I grew up, uh, my mother always had them. I like negotiating. Um, I like bartering. It's hard to negotiate and barter when you audition, AKA beg for a job, right? right? <laughs> when you're like, please. And then they go, you got it. And you go, hold on, let's negotiate. Yeah. I don't see how that works as well. <laughs> but so the scripts that come my way are all essentially, you know, Eddie, comma, late 30s, comma, Nick Miller, comma, having a, like, has potential but hasn't achieved them, comma, lives on his parents' couch. And I had just gotten so bored of playing that character that when I read Doug Renetti and I'm like, oh, Doug is a success and he's a capitalist and he's pushing, I thought, I love this start, but I can't just play a guy who's a 70s skis ball because the men I grew up around, my uncles in Chicago who, you know, would be in my house because they had legal trouble and we did do neon signs and they were drunks and they were partier and they were like real characters. They were all two things at once. They were those shady characters who might steal from you if you left your garage, <laughs> but they also really loved people and they really had your back. And there's a scene in the pilot where Joyce goes to Doug's home and it's on a really nice street. And she said, I never imagined you live in here. And he said, as a kid, I always wanted to live in a house like this. And now I do. And what that meant to me is Doug's home is not like you get there. And it's remember the drug dealer's house in Boogie Nights where yeah. there's a guy throwing firecrackers. <laughs> if Doug's home was like that, I pass on this project. You know that that house has been on for sale a couple of times. I think it's in Tarzana. No, that, that's in Pasadena. The, the Boogie Nights drug dealer house? Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. I think it, you could, it's been on Redfin a couple of times. Incredible. If that inside looks like that, I might buy it. Uh, <laughs> but so that scene for me showed me that Ellen understands that Doug can be two things at once. And Doug can be a total, like Doug does some things later in the season that are hard to justify in terms of treating people the right way. But when Doug, in Doug's defense, I can understand why he thinks that's the right move. And that becomes a character that, as you say, Andy, I am excited about it and I'm doing the hard push because I want to see what happens season two. Mm. I think Doug's the kind of character you can take him anywhere and I can do some things that are like really hard to stomach for audiences because it would feel honest. And I'm like, awesome. that's the recipe for a great character. I think Joyce is a great protagonist. I love the 70s. I love the world. So I think there's a lot. And I think Ellen's truly talented. So they, they, all the pieces are there. I also think what's really fun about it is that you, and you've done this before with some of the Joe Swanberg movies you did. Like, I think that it's fun, especially for audiences, to see you use some of the capital you've built up as the beloved gad about Nick Miller and push a little bit, you know, not just as a performer, but people, I don't want to kind of keep this part in. People like you. People like seeing you on screen and they're like, that's a nice, we like this guy. We want to spend time with him. And then that allows you the freedom, I think, to push a little bit of surprise. Yeah. You hope so. You know, you mentioned the 70s and loving that period. And there is a kind of 70s soul to some of my favorite work you've done, specifically When It All, that is is one of my favorite movies from the past decade. And I wondered whether or not, how, like, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about how fun it was to, like... The best. It, it, to, to get into that era, yeah. So, you know, I was born in 2001. So mm -hmm. for sure. me, the 70s... Mm -hmm. No, but in, <laughs> so being born in 78 in being raised in the eighties and early nineties, it was such a dorky era. And so like seeing photos of my uncles and my dad and my mom all hanging out in like Chicago and like near these cool cars, that aesthetic was something I was so deeply jealous of. And I really believed when my peer group got older, we would live in those photos. And then when my peer group got older, it was like 2002. <laughs> And I'm like, 
what are we doing? Like, we can't take a cool photograph. Like if you looked at my, <laughs> there's like photos in my like family album of like my mom had nine brothers and sisters and there's like photos of them all like drinking old style in cans. Their shirts are like this. There's a beat up old like 68 car behind them. The photos of like my cousins and I, it's so <laughs> dorky in comparison. <laughs> And so being able to be on a set like that and have the wardrobe, like a lot of times for, for me, when I get to work and I, I change into the character's clothes, it's hard to feel any different when what you're wearing is like a different pair of jeans. Yeah, right. I had shirt, but I would get there and put on a leisure suit, have necklaces and bracelets and ring. I had hair to hear that I was like blow drying myself because I got all vain about it. And I'm like, man, it's nearly impossible not to buy in right now. And so all of that, and then being to a set, the set designer did such a nice job because everything was 360 degrees. So even at like my character's desk, if you open up the drawers, the lead, the paper, the letterheads, everything felt, you know, period accurate. Right. So you were just like, man, this is the fucking best. If you shoot around the street, every extra, every car, and we should shout out the DP too, who I don't know, but like the lighting, it looks like the photos you're talking about. Totally. Yeah, this guy, Jason, did a great job. So like, what have you been up to over the last couple of years? I was curious, like what you've been watching, because like, I, I feel like you're, uh, you have a very discerning taste when it comes to the stuff that you choose to do. But I was yeah. curious, like what kind of stuff you've been enjoying, like checking out, you know, like, like, like over the last year or so. So I, I, I obviously love Succession. I think Succession is the best thing on television. And I really just, I've been trying to find something else to get excited about. And there's not much that I find exciting. Um, there's not much modern stuff that I think is great. Movies, I went and saw Sing 2 with my daughter and all the previews were going. And I just felt like, what is this shit? What are we talking about? <laughs> Chris, Chris, take five. We got to get into this. <laughs> Go ahead. But it just, it didn't, there's nothing that is saying to me, like, man, there's a period of time you watch certain things and you say, like, man, I wish I was in that, or I wish I was part of it, or I wish I didn't. I love when I feel jealous. I love when somebody does something and it feels so great that you go, like, God damn it, they beat, like, Eastbound yeah. and Down. When I first saw that. I was so mad at Danny McBride because I thought it was so funny. And I was like, that son of a bitch, dude, that whole tone, God bless him. Uh, so what I did recently to get like re-inspired by like something that was like no doubt great was I've rewatched every episode of the Larry Sanders show. Oh yeah. And I had watched it back in the day, but just to watch that and study what they did, like, look, it's a lot of it's dated. A lot of it is you're like, man, like that, you really did feel the nineties, but just the character development and the consistency of character and the character's wants and needs and the tone I'm like, man, what a great show, which leads me back to, well, I'm doing the pitch for Minx. I'm like, it's really at its core, if it's right, it's a workplace comedy. Yeah. This is simply about, they're like, yes, all the themes, feminism, of course, capitalism, of course, like, but this is about people trying to launch a magazine together. Yeah, it's kind of cool that way. I love that part of it. Like, it's really how a magazine would go. We had, you know, people consulting. They wanted that to feel very real. And that is how in 1972, you tried to move magazines. And if this one is going to be a success, then my thought is season two, if we get it. But what happens? What happens to this magazine? Does it get more and more popular? And I really like the, the actual, the way Larry Sanders obviously had the Larry Sanders show. They were all connected to that. So like, you never had to go to Hank's house. Right. You heard about his restaurant, but like, who cares? Right. I'm like, we all are connected to Minx. And at the bigger picture, bottom dollar, and that's the engine. If that breaks, these characters fragment and the show's done. Yeah. And that was something that uh, has been a nice reminder of like watching what I love to remember what I'm trying to do. So you did touch on the total barren wasteland of children's entertainment, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. And But it is a segue to talk about one of the things that you have done in the last few years, which has really come roaring into my life. In particular, and when I say my life, I mean my two daughters. So the thing that they're obsessed with. And the thing that they are obsessed with is uh, Into the Spider-Verse. They are? Which, yes. They, I'm not. They're not? They don't like it? Have they checked I mean, it out? I, yeah, I've tried a bunch. I'm a bragger. <laughs> have you told them a couple? Did you tell them that that's, that's daddy's voice that people they, are laughing at? Years old. They totally get it. They do we not. 
they tune off before my character even comes in. Wow. So I was nervous because I, uh, I mean, let me take a step back. I was in no way nervous, but I had wondered if they would ever be interested in anything like super heroic and that stuff. And clearly they had not been, and that's totally fine. But they loved the Lego movie. And I was like, Lord ah. Miller, you're involved in that. So let's let's give this a try. Very dubious until they saw Spider-Gwen. And then they yeah. were like, that's the coolest person I've ever seen. But now, I mean, they we 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 purchased the film, they rewatch it, they love it. Every viewing of the film has to watch a trailer for the upcoming part one of the two-part sequel. It's an incredible film. And you are you are tell your daughters that these very young TikTok podcasters <laughs> think you're great in it. Um, how has that project been? Because I feel like we talked about it right when it had come out, I think, you, or before I'd even seen it. And you said it was sort of, a, it had been in development for a while. And and when it was released, there wasn't this like, it's not like the Tom Holland Spider-Man. People weren't checking for it, but it's become a total phenomenon. And you made two more of them. I think the beauty of that is I am not a huge uh, comic book guy myself. I'm not a big, I am similar to your daughters in that I don't check out the action movies and I don't really care about the super. And you respect me. And I respect you. Know, yeah. I respect your wife more than you. <laughs> oh my God. Do you know them? It's incredible. It's not that, Andy. I just view her more as like the center of my life and you're. <laughs> this is, this is, it's, it's, it's getting real, but I could take it. I'm only, these aren't tears. This is just, I'm sweating. I had a funny thing happen with my daughter really fast where my wife and one of my daughters is off camping and I'm with the other daughter. And as my wife was saying goodbye to my daughter, my daughter said like, are you going to really miss me? And my wife goes, yes. And then she goes, but you're going to miss daddy more. And my wife started laughing. (laughs) (laughs) My daughter goes, daddy, daddy, I just said, mom's going to miss you more than me. And she laughed and she looks at me and she's like, I'm me. And I'm like, no, Elizabeth's right. But it's it's not, time you learned. Either of the kids, I am definitely here as the number one plus one of the group. Enjoy. You three have a wonderful family. Yeah, my, my thing, and I don't know if I've said this in the podcast, but but like, and I've come to respect, appreciate this, is that it's not a bad gig to be the vice president in that when the president <laughs> is in office, in yeah. the White House, in the situation room, you yeah. are a joke. You are completely yeah. extraneous and you have very little <laughs> role to play. It's, it's certainly in terms of authority. But there it's are a, a lot ceremonial. of ceremonial uh, like, yeah. like duties you have, you know? Yes, yeah, of course there are. You're around other vice presidents. You like to talk about how you're really running the White House. Oh, it is Veep. But then, and I, and I mean this sincerely, when the president is away on business or perhaps at Camp David uh, for a girl's retreat or whatever, your authority is tolerated. Okay. You know, it does, the mantle does shift to you, but you right. know, it is not. You That's because you're the like, only one who knows how to drive though, right? Like there are some basic needs that need to a, be fulfilled. A, a million percent. And <laughs> yeah. then, you know, and then perhaps, and this is hypothetical, a four-year-old might say, the reason I don't want to do that is because you do it badly and mommy does everything better. And okay. I'm like, okay, yeah. I'll take a fair. First of all, let's start from that. In the vice president, uh, and in terms of the authority, my <laughs> are a little bit older, I believe. Not by yeah. much, but a little. Last night, my daughter wanted to go to see Sing 2 at a movie theater. So I didn't know on a school night if that's the right move, but why not? And then I said, the screening starts at 5.30. We mostly cut sugar off at around 6. So I said, okay, here's the rule. One sweet. Pick it. She goes, nice. you got it. <laughs> we get in line. She goes, I really want one of those ices." And I go, oh, that's a sweet. And she goes, but I also want M&M's. And I was like, well, therefore, that's two, two sweets. sweets. And she goes, but we're in a movie. We need popcorn. And I go, we made a deal with the car. Within three minutes, she had all three sweets. And I'm <laughs> this is disgusting abuse of power. And when the, for the first 15 minutes of the movie, I sat there sulking because I'm like, I want her to throw a fit in the movie theater. But I'm like, this didn't end the way it was supposed to. She's eating a gallon of popcorn <laughs> and a gallon. I'm like, God damn it. I, I also love that you said you cut off sweets at six as if your children are wearing like dune skin suits for water, but pure like Gatorade being pumped through it. Take off your suit. Okay, but wait, but okay, Spider-Verse. I just wanted to know, like it, it kind of came into your life, uh, percolated got big. And so then you had to follow it up. So how has that experience been? Have you been in the booth working on the sequels? Has that been a good experience, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. I don't know how much I can say. I have been in the booth. 
You know, honestly, I love the character. I love working with Phil and Chris and everybody there. It's a wildly talented group. And what I love the most is their take on Peter B. Parker. Because, you know, I think the idea of playing a superhero in theory is cool. But in reality, like, you got to really care about the person. And I love the idea that Peter, when we meet him in this movie, you know, is kind of over it all. And, you know, because the truth is, if you look at like, I always looked at Spider-Verse, at least my part in it, like I was in an indie movie. And the indie movie was about a fallen superhero because the writing was so good. So when I'm in the booth doing those scenes, those scenes are just as good on page as any indie that I'm doing or any show that I'm doing. So it was a really fun way to view Peter as not a superhero, but just a guy named Peter from Queens. And that when he was talking about being a superhero, it's more, you know, talking about going to work and having responsibility to you, like talking to a young kid who you're trying to mentor about like, you know, show up at the office and be there for the people in your life. And I loved that view of Peter and I love kind of what they're doing with him. Everything about it's been a lot of fun. I can't wait. I mean, it is much anticipated in my household by all by all of us. It's I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I feel Jake, the same way. Man, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys. This was a really good first youth segment. I feel yeah, like I feel like yeah. we've we've really opened up a new demo the, for ourselves. The Zoomers are going to love this content about the about the the penises now, and the troughs and like I just feel like we're speaking their language. Do you guys mind if I say something directly to the younger audience? Yeah, definitely. Sure. Uh, okay, this is just to now my my people, fifteen to twenty. Okay, mm-hmm. what's up, everybody? It's your boy Jake Johnson. <laughs> I'm here on this podcast with these two geezers talking soups, boring stuff. Check me out on my TikTok channel. Check me out on my Instagram, my Facebook, my YouTube. Click below, like. <laughs> All right, and then you guys can obviously use that wherever you want for your advertising. Right. Uh, you could play it throughout this bit multiple times, whatever you guys need to do. I have like is, a, a, a Roblox kind. account that I'll probably be throwing that on, yeah. Just keep doing that. The mm-hmm. My group likes to watch the same short clip 100,000 times. <laughs> Is, is Twitch is Twitch a thing? That's it still a thing, is. right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So it's so yeah, well, I'll Twitch you the deets. Crypto.com, put it on make, make it an NFT if you want. Put it on the blockchain. Absolutely. <laughs> this is Thanks, so man. relevant. That's the amazing thing. Thank you. Pandemic, Ukraine, all these buzzwords, I know them all. Okay. <laughs> Cryptocurrency, uh, Biden, Trump. These are terms I understand. Okay. Yeah. Network, movies. Spider Verse, Marvel. We're letting you guys know. Put a hashtag in front of all those, and this is going to be your number one podcast. <laughs> it already was. 